My name is Matt Pfeiffer. This is Conversations on Retail, and I'm here today with my friend, Mike Grain. Uh, Mike, you and I have not done a great job of keeping up, but it's great to see you today. Thank you so much for making a few minutes to visit. Yeah, Matt, thanks for the opportunity. I look forward to catching up with you. Yeah, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off by throwing you maybe a little bit of a curveball. I know in 1982, you graduated with uh, an MBA from University of Cincinnati and went to work for the Procter & Gamble. So in, in the way of introducing yourself, go back and, and tell us about what it is, how it is that you ended up there at that moment, graduating and going to work for P&G. Yeah, well, it, it was a uh, long time ago for sure. Um, the, the, the short answer of the story is I graduated with a degree in information systems. It was actually called quantitative analysis at the time. And I started going out and interviewing for jobs. And there were a lot of job opportunities in the IT field, just like there are today. And I could be a programmer or a programmer analyst, and they were all about programming, et cetera. And I said, great, I'm willing to do that. You know, kind of what's the, what's the career pro progression? And it was really all about just programming for the rest of my life. And I'm going, I love programming, but I'm not sure I want to do that when I'm 40 years old. So I uh, decided to not take any of those offers, went back and got my master's degree in information systems and, ma and management. Uh, actually got a t chance to teach a few courses and things. Uh, and then I was positioned better to be able to focus on my business strength and leverage my technology strength at the same time. So uh, met a guy there who I was taking some MBA classes with. He, entered, he was working for Procter & Gamble. He introduced me and long story short, I started in Cincinnati in 1982. Now, where did, where did you grow up? Did you grow up in Ohio? Kind of grew up everywhere. I was born in uh, Minneapolis uh, area, uh, mo okay. quickly moved. My father was a university professor. He moved to Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. So he was at the University of Illinois for several years. Uh, I actually spent a year and a half in Tokyo doing, uh, my father went to take a sabbatical and I got a chance to spend some time there. Came back to Illinois, met my future wife in high school. Then I moved to Cincinnati to go to school. Uh, we got married my sophomore year in uh, it, while I was going to school. And then we moved to from PNG with um, Cincinnati to Cape Girardeau, Missouri, where they have a paper plant. I was the IT manager for the paper plant. And then in 1989, was asked to uh, join the Walmart Global Customer Team uh, down in uh, Northwest Arkansas, Fayetteville area. Well, what an amazing opportunity. And I'm sure at the time, it probably wasn't nearly <laughs> as exciting. But but talk talk a little bit about some of those early years at, at P&G and what, talk about what the, the culture, the organization was like. Talk about uh, some of your early, you know, roles and, and talk about kind of what your vision was for, for your career in those early years. Yeah, I, I think at, at the time, I, I definitely enjoyed leveraging technology to solve business problems. Um, I, I really saw the light bulb come on when I was teaching classes and I was teaching programming classes and people just couldn't get it and they were frustrated and they couldn't get it. All of a sudden, a light bulb came on and it was like giving somebody, a student, a calculator and saying, now that you've learned how to do it the hard way, here's how you use technology to work for you. And the light bulb went off. And, and that's what I really enjoy about technology. Technology is just a native, another set of tools in the tool bag to make things easier to understand, easier to think, to build. I'm a, I'm a big woodworker and I know every single tool has a different purpose and I can't use a hammer to cut boards and things like that. So using the right tool for the right job has always been very empowering to me. And especially things with technology that oftentimes are so confusing to people, they don't understand how it works. Working with people and solving business problems and leveraging technology uh, to make those things uh, really come to life is really something I get excited about, even to this day uh, in the space that I'm in. When you joined P&G, was it, was it a natural fit for you? And, and did you fairly quickly determine that this was a place that you could call home and, and make a career? I thought once I joined P&G, P&G was too big. It was too, it was just too confusing and overwhelming the day I started. So I figured I'd get in there, get it on my resume, six months, 12 months, whatever. I'd go off for whatever's next. And I ended up doing 25 years with P&G. Uh, right. Most of them on the Walmart customer team in Northwest Arkansas. 
Uh, I would have never expected I would have been with a company for 25 years. And, and yeah. when I hit about the 20 years, I was like, I'm going to stay with P&G my whole, my whole career. So it was really a, a great opportunity, a great company. Um, and, it, it, you know, I love the values, integrity, focusing on the customer, all that kinds of good stuff. Uh, and it was really something I felt like that I really enjoyed doing. And I felt like I was pretty uh, competent in terms of delivering value to the company back. So yeah. I ended up being there for 25 years. I love talking to guys like you, to folks like you, because when you went, when you, when you joined the Walmart team and moved to Northwest Arkansas in 1989, a lot was going on. I mean, Walmart had, had arrived and, uh, I had a great conversation with, uh, with Bobby Martin the, the other day, and, and he and I are going to sit down on camera soon and, and kind of, uh, you know, hear stories and so forth. But so much was happening in those early days. And you were part of what was then a fairly small team that was working very closely with Walmart mm -hmm. to ultimately, and others were involved, obviously, but P&G gets a lot of credit for the idea of, of the, the reverse bow tie that completely yep. changing the way that that Walmart would would work with their supplier teams. Talk about some of the, even even if there are things that you didn't yourself touch. You were there. You were you were part of it. You saw it happening. Talk about what those early days were like for you on on the Walmart team. Adversarial, transactional, stressful, all of the above. So, hmm. P and G had always thought of their customer as the people who bought products in the store and use them. That's their customer, okay? They didn't think of a retailer like Walmart as their customer. As a matter of fact, the interesting thing is, you know, the first task I had on my Walmart responsibility, obviously I was the IT manager, so I was hooking up computers and making sure networks are going. I mean, we couldn't even send an email to Walmart when I first started. There was no way to email uh, a Walmart. But one of the first questions, since you mentioned Bobby Martin, one of the first questions I got from my boss is, how much business do we do with Walmart? Pretty fairly straightforward question, right? Matt, that particular question took me three and a half months to answer. Because I could tell you how much Tide detergent I sold in California, and I could tell you how many pamper diapers I sold in Florida. We had nothing that looked across all of our customers. All of our customers were regional grocery players. Now we've got this big customer called Walmart, who, again, we're probably still only the number four or five customer uh, for even P&G, but they were continuing yeah. to grow. We had nothing that allowed us to say for one customer across all of our products, how much do we do? So it took me three months to get the, the answer to that question. We finally got the answer. We drove up. We actually had a chance to meet with Sam Walton and his leadership team and said, we do 250 million stack cases with you. And Sam Walton immediately said, what in the heck is a stack case? And we said, well, see, we have to equivalize Tide detergent and bounty paper towels and toothpaste, so we equivalize them in P&G. There's no such thing as a stack case. And Mr. Sam very nicely said, I don't think I understand what a stack case is, and I don't think I care. I care about how much of your stuff is selling at our register, and by the way, we don't make enough money on P&G. So if there was a cell phone back in 1989, I would have said, honey, don't – don't unpack. We're not going to be here long. Sam Walton does not yeah. like what I just shared with him. And yeah. so he said, I said, Mr. Sam, we have worked for four months to get this data. We would love to tell you what we sell of yours at the register. We don't have it. So he literally called Bobby Martin up. Mike Grain's coming over here to get some data. And I went over, got some data, and we found out, I'm not at liberty to share the numbers, but the profitability situation was not good for P&G at Walmart. And within one year of getting that information and sharing with our sales team, we took a very negative profitability situation and created a very positive one because our salespeople were just saying, if I ship you 100 cases, that's good. If I ship you 200, it's twice as good. If Walmart yeah. didn't make money on it, that wasn't their problem. Well, now it is their problem because we care about how much that person is, how much time is we putting in their shopping basket and how much is Walmart making on that particular money. So within a year, flip the profitability upside down. Uh, Sam Walton said, man, if we can do that with uh, p and G, if I can fix p and G, I I love that. If I can fix p and G, I wonder what I could do with all the other suppliers. So he had me work inside of Walmart with Bobby and Randy Mott and some, Randy Sally and some of those guys. And yeah. we developed what we thought, didn't know what it was called, but it was called Retail Link. And that's kind of right. 
That is when Walmart's platform of sharing that data with their external partners, because the more they know, the more they'll care. And if they know the information, we can all focus on the same problem and quit playing whose data is right. And it was a brilliant move by Sam Walton and the leadership team. And it was a, it was a very good a blessing for me to be part of that. I, I think that there are a lot of people that don't appreciate what a, a fundamental shift that was. Because if you look at kind of the history of organized retail, for the longest time, the brands had all of the power. And if, if P&G didn't want to sell to you, they weren't going to sell to you. And, and you were going to, you were going to take what they wanted to sell at the, at the, at the pricing, you were going to do whatever the brand told you to do. Mm -hmm. And then as the retailers began to, to grow and, and take market share and become more important as customers to these big brands, there, there started to be this, this tug of war. And uh, what, what Walmart and P&G and the other suppliers in those early days would do just in terms of sharing uh, and cooperating and, and see, seeing one another as partners, it changed, it changed the world. Yeah. Well, it was very, very adversarial and transactional when we first started because we saw them as a necessary evil to work with to get the products to the end customer. And when we turned it around and go, look, you're really not our customer and we're really not your supplier. The customers, the people who are buying the products in the sh on the stores every single day. Yeah. And actually when we started working on retail link, I flipped it around on them. I said, you know what? I'm a supplier to you, but when it comes to this retail link platform, I'm your customer. I'm the one who's going to be using that. And so don't think about me as a supplier. Think of me about as one of your customers. This is what we need in order to be able to more effectively work it. And by the way, most of it was just, point of sale data at the time. Now there's inventory data, there's forecast data, you name it, if it's available to help drive the product to the shelf, everybody's involved with sharing that information. The question yeah. is, how do you leverage it to your strength? So it's yeah. been really a fun ride. Well, and, and sharing of data was just the beginning. I mean, again, Tom Muccio um, yep. talked a lot about this idea of the reverse bow tie and how traditionally what you had seen uh, in, in organizations as you had, you know, marketing and supply chain and, you know, all these different teams on both sides and, but they would only communicate through, through one, one or two relationships. Correct. And the idea was to flip that and, and to bring the people that were, that were working on the same things and thinking about the same things together or let them interact. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we all saw things differently. I remember the first meeting we, uh, we had with one, one of the first meetings we had with Walmart it was kind of a brutal meeting. It was a little confrontational and kind of a little bit of tempers that were going. When we left, our finance manager said, you have no idea what they just said. And I said, well, they said a lot of things. What did you hear? The stores are the profit center. We go, so? That means the buyers are not the profit centers. The stores are the profit center. Mm -hmm. That completely changes the perspective about who the customer of this is, which it's the stores. I came out of there going, do you understand between P&G and Walmart, we are doing 100% of all our purchase orders invoices on fax machines? Really? Fax machines? There's technology out there that allows their machines and our machines to talk to each other and seamlessly share purchase orders and invoices and payments, etc. I mean, no, no offense to our sales folks, they didn't understand all that. And frankly, they didn't care. But yeah. dealing with P&G had become very, very complicated, very, very broken up, fractional, and to the degree we can actually connect the teams together. Sam Walton said something very interesting to us once. He said, if you thought of us as an extension of your company, you would treat us a lot differently. And he was absolutely right. If we thought about P&G and Walmart was one company, we would do things a lot differently. And yeah. so that's what we try to do is create that platform where we basically worked as, as one company to the degree we could. Well, we could sit here all afternoon and, and talk about stories, yeah. and I, and I and I would enjoy it so much, and I'm sure our audience would as well. But out of respect for for your time, sure. uh, we'll fast forward a little bit. You you retired three times uh, that I know of. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you you le you left P and G, and and then and then Walmart drew you in, and 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 you did some cool things at Walmart, and then uh, you had an assignment with with Crossmark, and did some really cool things with them as well. Talk about what it is you're doing today. Uh, with uh, with technology and with supply chain, talk about some of the the problems that you're working with, um, you know, with your clients today to solve. What are, what are the things that you're thinking about and working on today? Well, first off, the uh, the opportunity to work for all three 
a great big retailer, the best re retailer, in my opinion, of the world, which is Walmart, the best CPG company in the world, which is P&G, and obviously I'm a little biased to both of those. And then Crossmark, I got an opportunity to understand the supplier, the retailer, and the third-party service provider in the Northwest Arkansas area. That experience was invaluable because while you could sit in the meetings, now suddenly I've got to sit in the chair and I'm representing that particular company. So it gave me a very different perspective uh, about how they all work together. I think, Matt, the, the biggest thing that I'm working on right now, and I, by the way, I'm still working as a contractor, a consultant to Walmart, mm -hmm. and I'm working as a contract and a consultant to P&G, and I'm working as a consultant and a contractor to a lot of on-shelf availability services, like okay. shelf scanning robots and radio frequency identification technology and, and things like that. So go back to my, I'm a woodworker, I gotta have the right tool for the right job. If the on-hand of the item, if the on-hand accuracy of the item is not in a very good shape, there's no way my replenishment system can know what I have. So if it says I have, if it says I have three of these bottles in, the, in my store and I really don't have any because my on has wrong, well, then I'm not going to sell any because I don't have any and I'm not going to order any because I think I have three. So that on hand accuracy has traditionally been a very big problem in the industry. Mm -hmm. Shelf scanning robots, but really radio frequency identification is technology that's been around for 25 years and is now being applied to retail to get that on, on hand accuracy from 50%, which has been traditionally up to the high 90s. Now I have enough confidence to say, I really have three of these. And not only are they available in my store, but I can offer them a website and say, I've got three of these. You can come in and get them and I can tell you the bank, I can, you can make it that I've actually got that. That will be a game changer for industry because people want to be able to know that, they, that when they buy something or they have it delivered to their home, it's actually going to show up when they said it's going to show up. So, so that's the first one. And then there's some other opportunities for other challenges, getting problem. All my entire focus right now is making sure that just because a product is sitting in a warehouse, that it's not available for somebody on a store shelf, either for a customer to pick it up or a grocery, a retailer like Walmart to pick that item and deliver it to somebody. That's the big challenge is getting it through this supply chain. Um, and we're not even talking about the container ships off the port that are stuck out in the port. We're talking about the products in the supply chain somewhere. It's just not on the shelf where it belongs. A lot of my technology and work right now is to try and get it to the shelf where it belongs. And, and I know you'll correct me if, if I'm wrong, and, and I'm probably wrong, but it seems like a lot of the radical Im improvements that have been made have been made less because of, of, of know-how and really more as a result of, uh, of, of cost coming down on RFID and other technology that, that made broad application more more realistic, more practical. Is that, is that correct? Or is that, is that too simple of a, of an I, assertion? I think, well, I, I think it's a couple things. Number one, just like any other technology is, is, as the demand goes up, the cost goes down and the performance goes up. So just like a computer 10 years ago, you could buy for $4,000. That probably same computer probably cost you $400 and it's 14, 14 times more than the machine, right? RFID did the same thing. When I started working in 2003, the tags were 35, 40 cents a piece. Now they're four or five cents a piece. So they've come down dramatically, plus they perform better than they ever, they ever performed. So that, that's one. The second one is um, people continue. I mean, people, and I, I hate to use this generically, people don't count very well. If I have a rack of clothes and I ask you to count it and then I count it, I don't care if I got a scanner or whatever, we're probably going to take a while to do it. It's not very fun work. And most likely we're going to come up with different answers. RFID eliminates all that. So RFID, just like the technology you used to put in your, a tag in your car and drive through a toll booth and it takes the money out of your account, that technology has been around for, for years. Now putting it into a shirt or a pair of jeans as part of the packaging, we know exactly what we have in the store. We know exactly where it's located. That's a game changer in terms of a lot of categories. So I think you're going to see a lot of categories in apparel have already done that. The top 
70 retailers out of the top 100 are already completely endorsing uh, RFID. I think you're going to see electronics and sporting goods and automotive and all these other di different kinds of products eventually use that technology because you've got to know what you have and where it's located in order to be able to right. provide it to a customer. Well, which leads me to my next question. How long is it going to take for a game-changing capability to, be game to become a game-changing reality? How long is it going to take for the, these, um, these amazing technological uh, you know, enhancements and capabilities to make their way uh, in such a way that it's going to make a meaningful impact to the industry? Yeah. So a, a funny kind of fact, uh, a UPC code, those old UPC codes before we used to put a physical price on product and people would say 14 cents, et cetera. The UPC yeah. came along and it was a 25 to 30 year progression before we finally got that done. Uh, so while RFID has been around for a long time in retail, as it relates to item level RFID, we've only been doing this for 10 years. <laughs> so we've actually done a lot better than what we did with the physical UPC. Uh, I think we're just now hitting to that point where apparel is fully saturated. I think it will take off over the course of the next uh, three to five years. People are going to start leveraging it for other things because they're all trying to compete with people like Amazon who have got complete uh, availability and understanding of what they have in their supply chain. And the people who are doing that kind of work versus in a brick and mortar store where you got customers moving stuff and people stealing stuff and supplier short shipping, et cetera, you got to have the ability to know exactly what you have and where it's located in the store and expose that to a customer so they can buy it online and pick it up in store. I think it's going to continue to grow exponentially over the course of the next four, three to five years. And is it a situation where retailers like Walmart because because Walmart just just recently has begun kind of sharing some of their you know technology with with other retailers I mean they become more more cooperative which um, which has been interesting to watch is this one of those things where a leader like Walmart is going to take what they learn and, and share it with the rest of the industry because it makes the entire supply chain more efficient and everyone benefits from it or is, or is this something where you're going to see, you kind of a, a survival of the fittest where whoever figures it out is going to, is going to continue to dominate over everyone else. Yeah, so Walmart's always been a leader in technology and innovation, and they try and do it in such a way that it's not a Walmart solution, but they do it in a way that's industry standard. So I give them a yeah. lot of credit for that. They mm -hmm. work very closely with the GS1 global, global GS1 global organization to make sure what they're doing is in a standard way. So if you're dealing with Walmart and then you want to go reapply it with Target or somebody like that, you don't have to do it a different way if you're P&G or, or Haynes Brands or whatever. Um, so Walmart gets very actively involved with those kind of groups. So they're very willing to share collaboratively that way. What they're not willing to do, and I don't blame them, is the secret sauce of how they're going to leverage that technology behind their firewall to be able to take advantage of it versus what somebody else is thinking about. So from a standards perspective, yes, they're very good collaborators. You're never going to hear, here are the five things that they're doing with this technology behind, you know, out, transparently out in the industry because they, they want to leverage that for competitive advantage. Well, just in the way wrapping up, because I asked for 30 minutes, I want to be really respectful of your time. My sense is that you're probably about as busy as you want to be. Uh, but, but if there was a, a company that was interested in talking with you and in working with you, give us kind of a, the, the high points of, of what it is beyond on-shelf availability. What are the things that you're looking at? Where are the areas where, where you can add some value uh, if a supplier would want to reach out to you? And, yeah. and, if, and if you don't, if you don't want anybody reaching out to you, then close the door, <laughs> but just, you know, t <laughs> well, well, it may be reaching out to me or just maybe what are the things that you ought to be thinking about when it comes to this thing? So the, the real first thing is make sure you understand your business problem and then apply technology that makes sense. Um, so if on shelf availability in a grocery store is of high interest of yours, Make sure that you're looking at algorithms that tell you when you have issues of on-shelf availability or shelf scanning robots that automate the ability to be able to collect that data, et cetera. Um, you really make sure, because sometimes I think people go, well, this company's doing that, so let's do that. Wait a minute. They don't have the same problem we have. Let's use the right tool for the right job. So, so if, if, if folks are interested in that, what I can probably do is help them think through 
here is the issues I'm trying to solve. Are we using the right set of technologies? I, I am happy to do that. I am, I am uh, excited about this time. It's, it's, uh, it's definitely a challenging time, but we got to get the product on the shelf, know what we have and know where it's located and lose every t piece of technology we can to help drive that. And it's, it's just a fun time to be with this industry. Well, we, you know, as, as an industry, someone who spent 35 years in retail, we've been wrestling with a lot of these same problems since, since I've been around. On-shelf availability has been one of those things where, you know, we've thrown a lot of, lot of money, a lot of labor yep. at it, and, and we've made progress, but not meaningful progress. And it's exciting to live in a time where the technology is, is really capable of helping, you know, move a lot more quickly. So it must mm -hmm. be incredibly exciting for someone like you that's kind of grown up around IT and solving a lot of these same problems. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've, yeah. we, we are actually just now starting to look at technology like electronic shelf labels, where we replace the paper label with an electronic shelf label. Well, that's been around for years, right? But yeah. we're now incorporating the ability to literally pick up a product from a full case of where I'm stocking, scan the UPC, and that shelf label blinks and goes, I go here, I go here. So a pick to light kind of opportunity. Um, even for, for people who are in the grocery industry who are picking uh, orders for customers, have the ability to t the shelf to tell you where I'm located. Um, it, it's really just a fun time where you use the technology to solve those problems if that's in fact something that you want to do. And I think we've taken several runs at RFID and electronic shelf labels, et cetera, just because it was cool tech. Now it's, we have a very clear business problem. Our on hands are wrong. We've got the wrong product at the wrong location, et cetera. How is technology can help that? Now we're starting to think about it the right way. And that to me is a game changer. Quit thinking about technology as technology, think about the business problem and grab the right tool to solve the problem. Mike Grant, it's great to see you. Mike is the, is the principal of a company called Collaboration LLC. I know uh, LinkedIn is probably the very best way uh, for, for folks to connect yep, and, and absolutely. get in touch with you. Yep. And uh, it's great to see you. Thanks for making the time to do this. Hope you and your family have a great uh, and happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate the opportunity. And you guys have a great Thanksgiving as well. Take care. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.